Hi everybody, Lisa Tumby here and um, thanks for joining me on my endurance page for a bit of a Facebook live session. We've already had some technical difficulties so this is a second attempt. I hope it's actually broadcasting. Um, so I'm going to get uh, right into the questions in a minute but first I want to introduce my husband Hazley. Hello everyone, <laughs> how you going? Hazley <laughs> is also an ultra marathon runner and has a little bit to add to the conversation. Hopefully. Um, but he's also going to act as my interviewer if you like and read the questions out and hopefully um, not miss anybody and we'll get, you know, into get the... Right to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this is the first time I've, I've done this Facebook Live thing for a while so um, it's, it's all a bit new to me but we'll, we'll give it a go. Now what I really want to do tonight is I want to thank you for a starters for taking the time out of your evening um, to spend some time with me and I hope that I can answer your questions and to tell you a little bit about something that I'm really excited about that I've got coming up and one of the reasons this is all about mindset is that um, I'm about to launch a, a mental strength and emotional resilience e-course called The Path of an Athlete. Now this is going to be a nine week course and it's got um, lessons that come via uh, videos, via podcasts, via um, tutorials and we go over the whole step-by-step -step process of what it takes to develop a really a never say die attitude, a never quit mentality, how to achieve your biggest dreams um, and all of those sort of good things. It's all about developing emotional resilience so that when you get hit, when you get knocked down you get back up again and you get back up again and you get back up again. It's about dealing with failure, it's about dealing with fear. And so that's why some of the topics that tonight I'm going to you know, touch on um, are all around those sort of things. And I know we've got mostly runners um, uh, on board tonight, but this is really not just for runners, but it's, it's more for life in general. But now over to you, Hazley, because um, you've got to um, start give me the questions. Giving you some questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, First one here, um, changing that protective mindset after injury to get back to distance running. To get back to distance, or who's that from? Uh, that's Leanne Vanderkamp. Hi Leanne. Hi Leanne. <laughs> so, um, so after injury, so getting back after injury, now this is something that um, all of us as runners are going to have to face injury sooner or later. It just is a part of running. You're never ever going to... Um, get away with, with having no injuries. So it's really important that we develop um, an attitude of when you are injured, I'm still a runner. I still have the identity of being a runner. And th by that I mean that I don't go, oh well, I used to run and now I'm injured and I'm not a runner anymore, if you know what I mean. It's all about sort of developing that mindset that I am still a runner, I'm in the recuperation phase, and what else can I do when I'm injured uh, I know Mel Snell um, also asked a question along these lines, you know. And a lot of people drop their load when they've had an injury because they go, well, you know, what's the point? I've lost all my fitness that I worked so damn hard for and now I'm back at, at, at scratch, so to speak. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's, it can be really, really demoralising. Um, I'm just having a look at the feedback thing. Is our heads cut off or is that just... <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no, okay. So we try to do a, a three-way setup. So back to the injury thing. When you're coming back, I mean, it obviously depends when you're um, coming back from injury what you've been through, how hard it's been, what sort of drama. So I can't talk to the specifics of your injury. But it's developing that mindset around letting go of the fact that you have lost so much fitness, so to speak, okay? Get that out of your mindset. Stop comparing yourself to how you were before the injury and just start from now. Let all that go and just start taking the steps to doing what it will take. And that means being sensible. It means being sensible in your build-up and getting things gradually moving and just developing that mindset is that I'm on the comeback trail. Um, now I'm going to be talking a little bit about my journey with my mum this evening as well because a lot of what I've, I've learnt through ultra marathoning I've applied to a situation with my mum as many of you will already know because I post about it quite a lot she had a aneurysm uh, 15 months ago and um, she wasn't just injured she was completely debilitated there was nothing left and 
what I did with her was just just walk in faith that she was going to come back. I just walked day after day, even if I didn't see any progress for weeks, for months on end. I just carried on with her training program. I learned. I discovered new ways of doing things. I worked around her injuries. I worked around her limited abilities. And day by day by day, you know, we have, you know, done um, miracle things. In fact, the doctors are, are now, you know, coming to me and saying, well, how did you do that? You know, what's, what, what was your secret? The secret is dedication, determination, and having that, if you can dig into that fire, so if you've had an injury and you've got a, you've got a burning passion to be like you were before or better than you were before, start digging up that passion. Start finding out why that you want to want to come back. Why is it, and how you're going to prove to you? And you might have people that have said to you, you know, oh, you know, once you've had that, you'll never come back, or you know, once you've got this problem, you know, don't listen to any of that. Use it as your motivation to fight through. Um, when I broke my back when I was young, uh, the doctor said, you know, you will never run again. Well, they weren't right, were they? <laughs> you know, 70,000 odd kilometres later. It's all relative. It's all relative to what you and your perspective um, is all about. So I wish you well on your comeback trail, and I want you to take, get some fire in your belly about getting back there and start being determined and start taking those those uh, steps being being sensible in your build up so don't go and just try and smash yourself because then you'll be back down where you were I mean Hazley at the moment he's right into a surfing at the moment he's gone and got a rotator cuff injury and he's peeved off he's really peeved off because he was just starting to get it eh, with your surfing yeah and what are we doing in the meantime we're doing a whole lot of other, yeah, other training, rehabilitation, and just you know trying to keep that mindset fresh, and keep going. Even though um, not able to get out in the water, just or, or you know do too much. It's, yeah, yeah. It's just keep on. It's keeping that mindset in a good space, and that goes on to Mel's question, which was you know when you've had injury after injury, and she's had a bit of bad luck there. Um, it's keeping that I am going to beat this. I'm not letting this beat me. If you have an identity as I am this thing, and you'll, you'll probably you know, notice I'm very passionate about what I do, but that is the key to things. That is the key. Is that Hazley has now gotten to a level with the surfing that he was just getting into it and just enjoying it, and now he's been knocked back with injury, which is very common, by the way, because you know, you're not used to that type of thing, so then you, you, know, you quite often get injured. It's not losing all that. It's saying, okay, I've got to go back to the drawing board. I've got to start thinking outside of the square, how I can train the rest of my body, my technique, visualization. We spend hours watching surfing videos at the moment because he's visualizing how he's going to do it. Even though he can't get in the water now, when he goes back to it, that will all be there because he's visualized it. You know, And that's just another example outside of the running example. But um, yeah. So it, it's a matter of, of keeping yourself focused on the long-term goal and not giving up. All right, over to the next question. Um, we've got one here from Stefan Rapley. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know how to deal with a DNF. Oh. Please and thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the dreaded DNF. Well, um, Stefan, you're, for a start, know that if you're a runner, you're going to also have injuries, but you're also going to have DNFs. DNFs, especially if you're in the ultra running scene at all. Um, I don't know what distance that you've DNF'd in or how big a deal this was for you. But um, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories where I DNF'd hard out. <laughs> One was um, three years ago now, or four years ago now, when I was in the Himalayas, and I've been preparing for this for a year and a half to be... To, to do a world record attempt at the highest marathon ever recorded with a guy called Mike Allsop. And we've been, you know, film crews, huge sponsorship. Um, we trained for a year, we, we prepared the, the route. And now I'm an asthmatic, right? And so I knew that I was going to be pushing my limits to go to altitude and freezing temperatures and to try and run uh, a, a marathon non stop in this distances and that sort of terrain. But I decided to have a go anyway. I'd done a couple of other different things in the Himalayas and I'd gotten away with it. I'd managed them, I'd finished them and thought, yeah, I'll have a crack at this. Now, after a year and a half's work, after walking into base camp for nearly two weeks in the preparation for this and 
then we went up uh, a mountain called Kalapata, which is on the side sort of there from Everest, and that was where we were going to start our marathon. So three days before the, the actual event, we, we uh, did a recce up there, and we walked up to, I think it was 5,700 metres, somewhere around there, don't quote me on that, might be five, six, um, at three o'clock in the morning, and it was around minus 20 degrees, and we watched the sunset over Everest, I mean, a pretty special thing to do. Um, but what that did is that I got a, a massive chill in my lungs and I ended up with um, altitude sickness and a lung infection. And um, so being an asthmatic, for the next three days I had tried to battle against this, but you're at altitude. Now I don't know if any of you guys have been at altitude, but when, you, when you're at altitude, even walking is hard, okay? And then, Minus 20 odd degrees and snow and all the rest of the things that you get up there at, at altitude. Um, I was in really, really bad shape. Now six hours before I was about to do this mission with Mike, I, I was in such bad shape I couldn't even tie my shoelaces in. I remember like shaking in my big sleeping bag, crying my eyes out, thinking how the hell am I going to do this, what am I going to do, tossing backwards and forwards whether to, to quit or not, and um, got to the point where one of the, the camera guys came in and just said, look, you can't go, you can't go, you're too sick, if you go, you're not only putting your own life on the line, but you're putting the life of Mike on the line of possible Sherpas who have to come and rescue your ass, you know, there was a whole lot riding on it, and I had to make that decision right there to pull out, so I didn't even get to start, now that was devastating, it was a year and a half to work, there was film crews that we had the bloody prime minister on the documentary for goodness sake. We had Sir John Kerr and we had I, I talked about it with Sir John last week. Um, for me, that was a massive failure um, to actually pull out. But you know what? I've never ever regretted that decision. I've never second guessed myself because if I had gone out, then I would have been stupid. I would have, and the younger me would have done that. But because I'm wiser and I want to live, no race is ever worth risking your life for. You can always come back to fight again another go, have another go. A DNF is something that, it, it ticked that box of, I've done a D, I've got, I've had a DNF, you know. Accept the failure as quickly as you possibly can. Let the emotions come, cry, boil your eyes out. I mean, I remember uh, it, during this, you know, failure, Actually, that's where I um, fell in love with Hazley, actually, because I would ring him up on the phone and, from there in an absolute mess and totally devastated, and he would pick up the pieces, pretty much, eh? Hey? You know? It was pretty pretty intense, It eh? was pretty intense. It was, um, yeah, I always look forward to the phone calls, though, just to make sure how you're progressing and things like that and that you're okay and... But you, yeah. you know what? The, the, the amazing thing that he did for me was to provide unconditional support um, he didn't care that you know I'd failed or uh, you know any of those sort of things. What was important to him is that I come back home safe, you know, and you know four years later we got married. Um, <laughs> it was pretty cool. Um, so DNFs, DNFs are part of the tapestry of a runner's rich life. Get over it. Deal with the failure. Feel the emotions. I want you to go home now, and I want you to sit there, and I want you to boil your bloody eyes out if you have to. Feel everything that that DNF meant to you. Feel the loss of that, that time that you invested. Feel the loss of the energy that you invested. And then let it go. Let it go and get on with it. And turn that story around into your next success. This is part of the next part of your process. Is, is it's always a stepping stone. I mean, you would have heard about Thomas Edison doing, I think, 10,000 attempts to create the light bulb or something, and it was on 10,001 that he actually succeeded. And he said something about, you know, the successful people are the ones who just do it again when they fail, and do it again, and get back up on the horse, and keep going. And know that you're in the best of company. I mean, you know, I had uh, Dean Canassis on my podcast, Pushing the Limits, a few weeks back. I've seen D Dean Canassis, DNF, a number of times, you know? Do you think he like wants to give up ultra running because he's DNF'd? Nah, it's just part of the of the thing of if you're not DNFing on a regular basis then you probably aren't pushing your limits hard enough, you know? That's what that's the way I see it. 
that failure is always a stepping stone. It's always got a lesson for you. Find the lesson within that, correct whatever needs to be corrected, and then move on. And if somebody teases you about a DNF or gives you crap about it, um, tell them to come and see me. I'll sort them out, okay? <laughs> so we've got another question here um, from Sari Panther. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how I can change my mindset from you're too slow to one that still wants to increase my running speed and distance, but is a bit kinder. But is a bit kinder. Sorry, thanks for your question. Um, I'm feeling you on this one. Look, I have always been slow, <laughs> so I'm really feeling you. It's really, you know, um, it's really hard when you see other people that have more genetic talent than you, perhaps, or more abilities, and they don't train half as much, and they speed past you like there's nothing, you know, like nothing else. And, you know, welcome to the world of probably 50% of the women that I coach. <laughs> um, we might not be the fastest things out there, but there are other things that are more important than speed. Um, and this is one of the reasons I've never joined a Harriers club, because for me, it, the, the journey of running isn't all about how fast I got over the line. Um, it's all about how I managed to overcome all the obstacles that I had to get there. I know inside what I've done. I know inside that what I've trained. I know what I've de dedicated to it. And I don't compare myself to um, other people's times. Um, it's really all about your journey. I don't care how slow you are, you're lapping everybody who isn't running. And I don't care if you don't have a lot of talent. Something I talk about a lot of my speeches is a thing called talent versus determination. If I have two young athletes, and one's super talented, but they don't have a good attitude, and then I have a, a really determined one, but they don't have any genetic ability, um, I'll take that determined one any day and turn them into an ultra runner, a person who can achieve incredible things. Now, that means we're probably not going to win any Olympics or anything, or the local 5K time trial, trial fun run at the park, but who gives a shit? Honestly, it's your journey, it's your path to fitness, it's your path to achieving some huge dreams, you know? I have a very small lung capacity, I have a three and a half litre lung capacity, I'm an asthmatic. I had never had the uh, genetic makeup to be a top runner. Um, but I've written two books about running and I've run 70,000 kilometres, so who says that I'm not a runner? Um, this, this, um, um, this is another thing that I, um, you know, I was talking to you last week about it. Um, one of the ladies that I coach, um, Gus Benzie, and I'm sure she won't mind me telling you her story, she just did the Northburn 100 mile, all right? But go back three years, when I met Gus, she was in the Northburn race, she was doing the 50k, and two k's into it, she um, twisted her ankle and she had to pull out, and she was... Absolutely devastated, as you can imagine, two k's into it. She hadn't even got three quarters of the way around. But she didn't give up. She had this fighting, determined spirit, and I coached her and Neil, with Neil Wagstaff, my partner at business, uh, business partner at Running Hot Coaching, and she kept fighting. Now, she had asthma as well, and she had setback after setback after setback, but the difference with, with Gus is that she just kept going. She'd ball her eyes out, she'd fall down, she'd cry, and then she'd moan and bitch about the bad run that she had, and then she would get back out there again the next day, and she would get back out there, and she would keep fighting. And she still said to me, like the other day, you know, but I'm not a real runner. I'm, I, I know She was not going to enter the Northburn 100 mile, because she said, I don't want to take away the space from another real runner. Well, I, I, you know, I nearly had to kick her up the pants for that one, because I thought, you are a real runner. Just because you're not a 50 kilo waif, and you've got boobs, and you've got hips, and you're, you're slower than um, Sage Canada, that doesn't mean that you're not a real runner. You are a real runner. And this imposter syndrome that um, many of the people that I coach deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, I find so tra tragic, and I mean, I've faced it all the time. But you know, fake it till you make it, and believe in yourself, and back yourself. And never say to yourself, oh, I'm not a real runner, though, not like those ones who, who, you know, do the 10K in God knows what time, you know. That 
doesn't matter. And that's the mentality of a uh, Harriers club or whatever. But that's not the mentality that I adopted. And if I'd, my very first 10K, and I'm probably rambling here, but my very first 10K was at a fun run, and this is in my early 20s. And at 5Ks, I had to pull out where well, I was having an asthma attack because I'd gone out too fast and too hard. And I was being passed by grandmothers three times my age who were also very overweight. And I, I got to the 5K mark, pulled out, crying, devastated, and going, oh, I'm never going to run again. Now, if, I had, if I'd never run, what would I have missed out on? What would I have missed out on? What would I have not achieved in life? You know, Never let the fact that you're a slow runner um, deter you. I mean, ultra marathoning, you, you fit in perfectly because three quarters of us of us are. <laughs> um, what's that analogy? You know, run like a, no, eat like a horse. Um, what was it? Drink like a fish, and run like a turtle, turtle wading through mud or something like that. And that's perfectly fine as an ultra runner. So if you're slow, stop beating yourself up about it. You have a genetic ability range. Train within that ability range. Push yourself within that ability range. Always talk to you, yourself with kind words. Pat yourself on the back when you have a success. Never ever berate yourself for what you weren't born with because you can't change that. And whatever you can't change is not worth fighting against. Okay. Next one. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so quite cute, eh? we've got one from Sue, Sue Byers here. Um, I'm, I'm in my late 50s and running first 50k ultra in October. So after running several marathons over the past few years, how do you make the jump to 50k trail? As I expect I'll be out there 10 or 11 hours. It's a really good question. So did you all hear that? I hope Sue, so. she's, you got to speak up young man. Um, you, when you're tr uh, transitioning from road marathons into a 50k trail race, well, for starters, the distance between 42 and 50, you know, it's, it's, they're both hellish long, let's be honest. Um, that's not a make or break at all. The, what is a, a real change in mindset when you're going into trail running? Now, I want uh, you, Sue, to forget all the times that you ever ran on a road marathon. Forget the time that you did it in, the four hours or the four and a half hours or the three and a half hours. Get that out of your mind, and you are correct. It could well take you 10, 11, 12 hours if it's a really tough uh, trail race. So you have to have a change in mindset when you're coming from road, and this is something that um, the people that I coach often struggle with. Um, the ones I find actually the worst at this are, are triathletes who are coming from, you know, real, it's all about time. When you go on to trail, you're facing a whole different ball game and the whole world slows down I don't care who you are you're going to be doing a trail um, um, 50 a hell of a lot slower than you would be doing on a road 50 having said that when I do 50 kilometers on the road I'm always more exhausted and my bones are more tired and my skeletal frame is more tired and it takes me longer to recover than it does if I've done 50 on the trail now why is that well for obvious reasons, like the impact on the road, on the joints, takes more. You take more of a beating, so um, it takes a bit longer to recover. Um, you're also going at a faster pace, so you also need longer to recover. When you are going on a trail, typically, what I find, if it's a mountainous trail, the the hills with my small lung capacity are always my, you know, hard thing for me and. Um, that's what I find really tough. I, also on a trail, you have, if it's, you know, a very, unless it's a flat trail, which most of them aren't, most of them are very mountainous. Yeah. Um, so when you're on, a, on a, a, a very mountainous trail and you're up and down and you're up and down, I find that transition between running the hills, running downhills and all that sort of stuff really quite tough. So number one, so you have to train on the trails. If you're running a trail, 50, train only on the trails, pretty much exclusively. Um, so train always on the terrain that your race is going to be in, to the best of your ability, obviously. Um, but most of us have got access in New Zealand to, to good trails, all right? 
you need to have stronger feet, you need stronger ankles, and you need to understand that you will spend some of that time walking, very likely. Yeah, probably 90% of the time, especially if you're, you're in your 50s and stuff. So just get that in your head, and then you actually find that, yeah, it's 10 or 11 hours, but overall, it's actually probably um, less intensive or less mind-blowing than a, a marathon where you don't stop and you're going hard, hard out on a trail. You, you have that natural progression of going up, going down, and having to slow down and having to walk through, and you might have mud, you might be having, you know, really steep things where you're on all fours, depending on what you're doing. Um, do consider, um, if you have any back issues or anything like that, you might want to run with walking sticks. If you do, and, and I've done that a lot um, in ultra marathons, so I take walking sticks with me if I'm on a really rough trail, because it just saves my back. So that's a tip for anybody who has got back issues, or is weaker in the upper body, or... Um, just needs a little bit more stability because they don't feel quite as confident on the technicalities of the trail. Um, take some walking sticks with you. However, and this is something that I did wrong with Hazley in his first North Burn attempt, he didn't train with the sticks and then he took them out on the actual North Burn A. What happened? Yeah, so I uh, was not coordinated enough to be able to go with him. Yeah. So it uh, was not going too well. No. Because <laughs> I was just like... <laughs> He was totally unco and because um, he hadn't trained with it, so he hadn't gotten used to it. Yeah. So he was virtually carrying them all the time um, and not, not using them correctly. So if he'd trained with it, it would have been a different story. So I actually took them off him and he was better off. He also didn't have any back issues, so it wasn't probably necessary for him. But that's something for you to consider. Now make sure, so that you're also in a good pair of trail shoes, not road running shoes. Um, and... Make sure all your gear fits for the occasion that you want. So in other words, train, train on trails, train with trail shoes, train with trail equipment. If you have to take a backpack, train two or three times a week with the backpack. Not every run because that will change your running style too much, okay? So if you're doing any speed work or whatever, leave the backpack at home. But if you're doing a long, slow run in the weekend perhaps, make sure you've got some... Um, some stones in your backpack and you're running with it, all right? And get used to the weight that you're going to have to carry. And just change your mindset to a slower mindset and be prepared in your mind to be out there for 10, 11, 12 hours, whatever it takes, and enjoy the day out. Enjoy it as a journey, okay? And once you've done one, you'll know what I'm talking about and you'll know that that transition, uh, the difference between the two. All right. Um, the next one, please. So another one here from Barbara Ann Young. Hello, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Uh, what about keeping on running past 50 years, do's and don'ts? All right, I'm about to hit that one pretty soon myself. Can't believe I'm that old. Um, not quite there, but we'll be close. Firstly, uh, you never, you don't lose your endurance um, nearly as fast as you lose your speed, okay? So you might have heard this analogy you might not have but this is a this is a fact a 19 year old and a 64 year old have the same level of endurance all right and you're actually peak in your endurance at about 48 which is what I am at the moment that's your peak level for your endurance okay so when I was in bad water you know Death Valley in the USA for example the average age of the athlete standing on the line next to me was 48 years old um, so you're in good company. Um, I've got friends in their 50s, in their 60s, in their 70s that are still running ultra marathons and absolutely knocking it out of the park. So just know that your age does not um, deter you from uh, doing ultra marathons because number one, the number one thing you need for ultra marathons is a tough mind, and this is what this is all about. You have to be hard as nails up here and not give in, um, and you have to be able to cope. And when you're older, you have a uh, more tendency to do that. You also have less ego, perhaps, than a 20-year-old male who's going to charge out of the gate, at a, at, you know, like a bull. And um, you know, so females is, uh, is the other thing. Females with ultra marathon running, uh, statistically, we're really, really good at ultra marathon running. We have better burn uh, energy burning systems. Statistically, we drop out of races less. We DNF less. 
Um, we persevere through obstacles um, and, you know, so be encouraged that if you're in your late 50s, you might have your best yet to come, okay? Now, going over to the flip side of, of what you need to do in your 50s, um, I think someone else asked about that, what, how do you train differently in your 50s? Each decade that you go through, you need to train quite and considerably different. Um, and what I've found in my progression through my 20s, 30s, now into my late 40s, the older you get, the more you have to focus on mobility work. And by that I mean stretching, yoga, Pilates, um, using the foam rollers, using the myofascial release balls, resistance bands, all of those types of uh, things and those types of products. And using that, the, so doing mobility on a daily basis. Now, what happens as we get older, and especially if we're doing a lot of running, you know, our muscles and everything get shorter, they contract, uh, and everything gets more stiff and brittle. And you basically, you've got to stretch them back out. You've got to release all those tight, knotty fibers. Um, so make sure that you prioritize your mobility work. And when at Running Hot Coaching, when we do a training plan, it's not just a running training plan, and it's not full of junk miles, it's full of quality training, and it's full of mobility work and strength and conditioning work, um, technique, so that you can optimize yourself across all of those things. So if we move over to the strength and conditioning, so doing uh, weights or body weight workouts is really, really important as well for you. You need to have a really strong core, and by that I don't just mean your six pack, but I mean your transverse abdominis, your lower black, your multifidus, your, your, your glutes, your hip um, area needs to be very, very strong. Um, and so that means doing a whole lot of exercises around that sort of thing. Um, and we've got you know tons of programs uh, at Running Hot Coaching if you, if you haven't got an idea what you need to focus on, but core, hips, glutes, knees, all of those areas need to be strong, your lower back needs to be strong, um, the older you get the more important that becomes and as we get older we also lose muscle, on average we're losing muscle 200 grams a year, so even if your weight is staying the same you're likely seeing a muscle decline and an increase in, in your fat levels, so you have to counteract that by building your muscles up constantly. No? <laughs> nice and strong. You've got to be strong. Don't be afraid of, of uh, weights either. I, 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 I do a lot of weight training. Um, I do a lot of uh, CrossFit type exercises or body weight type exercises, Tabata. And I mean, I've got a very muscular physique anyway, so I don't have as much problem as a lot of other women have. Yeah, a little bit. But and don't worry about building muscle. You're building a lean, strong body. That's the important thing. You know, yes. the more muscle you have, the more calories you've also burned, the less fat you will, you will build up. And it keeps, so weight training is really an elixir, a youth elixir. It, it releases uh, growth hormone, it, it helps with your hormone balance in your, in, in your body, it keeps you younger. So don't just run. If I could give runners one piece of advice is that running alone does not make a strong lean body. You have to do the weight training. You have to do the mobility work in order to be an all-round fit person. Um, okay. We've got a few shout-outs. Um, I'll just jump in here yeah. for a yeah, second. Um, for just want to say good day to Gus. She's watching online there. Kevin. Hi, Gus. Um, from Hawke's Bay. Kevin Merton, a uh, mate of mine from Hawke's Bay. Uh, Brett Cowper. Um, and Jason Crow, <laughs> local lad here. <laughs> He's, um, yeah. Is your running partner? Watching. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll be out again soon there, Jace. Yeah, 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 so. and I, I, there's still that charity run, Jace, that needs to be organised. Um, <laughs> we've got a question as well on yep. the Facebook Live post itself um, from Royaline Stanley. Yeah, Royaline, yeah, I know Royaline. So she says, yeah. hi Lisa, I was wondering, how do you deal with post-ultra blues? Post-ultra blues, oh man, I've written about 10 articles on this. <laughs> Go and check out some of my blogs. Post-race blues. Now, why does this happen? When you're doing an ultra marathon or, or any long endurance event, 
Um, number one, you've trained for, for months and you've focused on solely on one goal. And you've had this big mission and your whole life has been you know, focusing in on this one point. You've actually done the race and you've achieved your goal and now that goal is gone. And that can you leave you feeling um, as if you've got no orientation. And typically what you'll see is people crossing the finish line and going, never again am I going to do that, ever. No. <laughs> and then two days later, <laughs> what happens? They're back on the internet trying to find the next Sign race. Sign me up. Sign me up. Because they've lost that, that goal. And so th this is why goal setting is so important for people. So goal setting, when you have a goal, when you focus on it, it really pulls you towards it. And you, you, you inevitably... You'll, you'll get there because you're focused on that goal. And when we suddenly got that goal is gone, we were like a little bit disorientated. So just understand that. But what you need to do is you need to give your body time to recover before you jump into the next mission. Um, one of my friends said to me once, and I'd just done this 222 Ks in the Himalayas race, and I got to the end of it, and the very next day I was going, oh yeah, but so-and-so is doing this, and that was better, and... I should be running more and doing this. And they said, man, listen to yourself. You've just run the biggest race in your life, 222 kilometers. Instead of celebrating your successes, you're looking to the next higher mountain and somebody who's done it better and, and has achieved more or, or whatever. You, you have to actually pat yourself on the back and go and enjoy and celebrate and internalize that which you have already uh, achieved really really important for runners to go and sit back and go damn I did well I finished that I achieved that goal pat yourself on the back and make sure that you integrate that win into your psyche before you jump on to the next the next best thing now in regards to depression why this happens after a race another reason is because all you have used up all your endorphins in your body all your serotonin right from in your bone marrow has been sucked out during that race to keep you going and ultra marathon running really doing these super long distances in the short term it isn't healthy and you're actually pulling out a whole lot of nutrients and you, you, you can be stuffing up your adrenal systems you can get adrenal fatigue um, you can yeah, get depression you can get a whole, you know, a lot of raft of things. So what you have to do now is go into a recovery phase, and this is a part of your training program. Okay, as an as a coach, I put someone through their training block, and when we get to the end of the race, they are then in the next phase of their training, which is all about recovery, recovery of the mind, recovery from the fact that you've just tortured yourself. You might even have some post-traumatic stress from the from the pain that you put yourself through. I know I did when I ran through New Zealand. I got to the end of that, and I, I had nightmares. I had that I had to run, <laughs> and I had issues in my in my mind for a good long period afterwards because I had post traumatic stress. Um, but what the typical pattern that you will see when you finish a race and you're elated, maybe, or you may be happy for the next, for starters, the first 24 hours it might not have even sunk in yet. And then after that, it sinks in, and then you're happy, and you've achieved it. And then a day later, you, you, you're starting to wind down. It's another thing that I forgot to mention is that you are running on adrenaline, on cortisol, and you've pushed your body to the limit to get there, and that's still churning in your body for the next two to three days, okay? And then you start to come down like this, and then you start to really bottom out and for me, it was always about a week out, uh, especially if I you know, um, had to fly home and there was jet lag on top of it, um, and all the hullabaloo of, of the race or the event that you've done has died down, and it's suddenly it's like a death, you know? And I'd come home, and I would be depressed. Physically, the biochemistry of my body was altered, and there was a physical reason for why I was depressed. So what I would do is I'd go home to my mummy, and I'd say, cook me some chicken soup, and put me into bed and give me a hot water bottle and make me a cup of tea and just hunker down for a few days. I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to talk to media. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to be within myself and to digest it. The first time it happened to me after the Marathon de Sables in Morocco, 
I, I didn't understand it and I was in a very um, upset state thinking this isn't normal, you know, I should be happy, I've made this amazing um, journey. But your mindset is, you, 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 you hold, you've been through something big, okay? It's like childbirth almost, <laughs> I haven't had a child, but you know what I mean. It's a, a very emotional oh. event that you've been through. Now you went through the well, Grand Kagan, Grand Grand. Well, one of the things I find um, in getting the post-race blues, it's mainly because, well, for me, um, I've spent 20 weeks leading up to this event training diligently, making sure that I'm doing all the right stuff, and you're focused. You've got this 20-week plan. You've got this goal at the end of it. You get to the end goal. You complete this event. doesn't matter what time you do. You complete it. That's, that's my thing. And um, from there, it's like, you drop off because there's that's it. You've got to that twenty week part, and but you haven't got the energy to actually go back out training or anything. No, and and that's why I like to do it cyclical. So you do an event, train for it twenty weeks, and then try and focus on something else. So for me, it was focusing on surfing, but got injured. So yeah, yeah. Um, for now, it's it's figuring out something else. But um, yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. It's knowing that that time will pass too, mm -hmm. and that you have to you have to digest it mentally. You have to digest the race physically. In fact, the, the doctors and the professors that I you know um, that I follow, so like uh, Tim Noakes, for example, who's like the absolute guru, running guru, says it can take up to six months for you to recover from an ultra marathon on a cellular level, depending on the, the distance that you that you did or even up to a year. So when you're doing really massive ultra marathons for a start, I don't recommend doing any more than two to three, three max um, in a year. And I didn't follow that advice. And um, you know, that's why I can say it now. Um, if you want longevity in the sport, you can't do that level more than three times a year and preferably twice a year max, okay? And I'm talking over 100 k, so 100, 200, 250, whatever, those sort mm. of distances. You, you should not be doing them more than twice a year if you want to be around in five years' time in the sport still. Um, and you know, that's another thing that's burnout um, that I could talk about, maybe that's another one. Just, um, just stepping off topic here for a sec, um, you're on a podcast. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and the different people you've interviewed and where we can find your podcast? Oh, you're very good. He's good at this advertising stuff, just, eh? Just, um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm really excited about my podcast. I've been doing it for a year, but I've just relaunched it and, and grown it and, and really pushing it at the moment. And it's called Pushing the Limits. Now, a lot of Kiwis don't know what the hell a podcast is, but basically it's your own type of radio show, okay? And... You can find these, if you've got an iPhone, you'll have a podcast app and you can go in there and you can search for Pushing the Limits and my little show will, will come up and then you can go in there and subscribe to it, write a review if you like it, please, five star, um, and um, listen to some of the people. I've had some incredible people. Last week I had Sir John Kerwin and we were talking about mental health and our, both of our personal journeys with mental health, depression. Um, how we, we got through that. That was a really amazing interview to have a really open, honest, genuine discussion. I've had Dean Carnassus, a lot of you probably have heard that, that podcast because I you know, was so stoked to have Dean on the show. And even Dean opened up about the, the, you know, some of the things that he wouldn't normally open up about in the public sphere, but um, he did because he was talking to another ultramarathon runner and that's what's uh, a little bit different. Um, I've had Maz Quinn, who's the number one surfer in, in New Zealand, or the most famous surfer um, for yeah. the past decade, and um, yeah, his insights. Um, so, but I don't just have sports people, I've had uh, professors. Um, next week I have the CEO of Middlemore Hospital, or the Director of Hospital Services, talking about health. Um, you know, I have some really incredibly interesting people, so please... Uh, do check out, thanks for letting me do the advert. <laughs> yeah. Go to Pushing the Limits and uh, check that out and share that with your friends. So we've got um, another question here from Colleen Warren. Hi Colleen. Uh, I'd love to hear your advice on how to get past the mindset of anxiety towards getting in pain and going to the gym. Yeah, it's yeah. a good one. It's a good one. And um, yeah, I saw Colleen last week, so um, hi Colleen. <laughs> thanks for the, for the question. Now, when I'm, uh, say I'm at work all day and I know that at five o'clock I'm going to go training and typically at four o'clock I'm going, oh no, I've got to go training and it uh, might be a high intensity training so it means it's going to be painful. I typically do not 
feel like I want to do it. And I go, but I go anyway to the gym. And when I get into the gym, I go into the changing rooms. And as I'm changing into my gym gear and getting out of my work clothes, I am cleansing myself symbolically of the work day and I'm putting on my warrior protection, my armor, if you like. I am putting on a different personality to go in there. And I know that sounds a little bit weird, but I do this also when I'm, when I'm racing. When I'm feeling the fear, when I'm feeling scared and all the things, or when I don't want to train and I'm having to psych myself into it, this is what I do. I put on my running gear, tie up my shoelaces, I get myself my tear tied up and I know that that means for me it's battle time. It's time to put your battle face on. Then I'll typically have a little bit of a drink of water. Another trick, Colleen, is um, about an hour before you go training to have a, something healthy to eat, maybe a few almonds or um, something that'll just pick you up. Um, a coffee, maybe. It's not the best way to do it, but a little bit of a cafe, just so you've got the energy to get through. You've got through the, the day of work and now you're going to the gym and you're going to give it your best shot. And typically what I find happens is that when I step out, I'm a different person. I put on my armor and I go out into the battlefield, the battlefield of my mind, all right, and I'm ready for fighting. The next thing that I do is that I go through a very slow warm-up process. Now, the older you get, the, war the more important that warm-up phase is, okay? So go out there and do a lot of uh, stretching and activation routines. So if you've been sitting all day, you need to activate everything and get everything right and slowly build up your heart rate until you start to feel as if you're starting to get it. You're getting that rhythm again, okay? And then when you get really hot and you're starting to sweat, that's when you start to go hard and not before, okay? And by then your mentality will have changed and you would have be, you'll be able to fight and push through those barriers. And all this time, you start talking to yourself about you're going to do it, you're going to be strong, you're going to fight, and, you know, look at yourself as like, I'm, I'm bloody awesome doing this, I'm a rock star, okay? These are the silly shit that goes in my head, okay? <laughs> but it works, whatever works for you, visualisation, these types of tricks are really, really key. Um, man, I'm giving away the house here. <laughs> um, I just wanted to go back to that post-raise blues. If you're in the middle of this right now, just know that within two weeks' time, you should be through this. You should be through the worst of it, and life will start to go back to a normal balance, okay? And when I say to people, if they've done something massive, like a grand-to-grand -grand ultra or a multi-day stage race or some big, massive things, is when you come back, don't get divorced, don't get pregnant, don't take any drugs, and don't, um, yeah, just don't make any life-changing decisions because you're in an altered mind state. Understand that? And just um, don't do anything major in that time when you're all upset. And I've seen that time and again. I've seen it within myself uh, where I've come, down and, uh, come back and done something radically changed, you know, things in my life when I wasn't in a situation where I should have made those decisions. It's like you don't, you don't make life-changing decisions when you're drunk. We don't make them post ultra either. Good advice. <laughs> so, um, hello, Renee. Awesome. I think that's how you say it. Awesome. Yeah. Um, got a question here. As a beginner runner, overcoming the barriers that stop you running, for example, anxieties about running and a change in mindset from I can't run to I can run. Well, Renee, you Renee. can run for starters, all right? So the first thing I want to tell you is that you have to start off really slow, and I want no pressure. In this first phase of, of an absolute beginner runner, which I believe you are, okay? Yeah. So take small steps. I want you to shorten your stride, and I want you to run just power pole to power pole, okay? Or, yeah, 100 metres at a time, and then walk, and then run, and then walk. And what you'll find when you do this system for a few days, you start to build up the distance that you can do, and you start to build up your confident that, confidence that you can actually do this thing. A lot of beginner, absolute beginner runners, they tend to breathe wrong. They start getting all anxious and they're breathing in the top third of your chest. So before you go out for a run, I want you to do some deep breathing exercises where you're breathing in through your nose for the count of four, 
holding it for the count of four and then out for the count of four and then holding it for the count of four. And I want you to do that for a good two minutes before you start running. So your body is nice and oxygenated and you're also getting rid of the anxiety in the body when you do that. When you breathe deeply into your stomach, using your diaphragm, you actually activate uh, the calming receptors that are down there and it actually relaxes the body. So you do that before you start running, okay? And you do a good warm up, and then I want you to gently go out, just baby steps, just take baby steps, little wee tiny steps, and then going and to, a, to a point where you're starting to feel fatigued, then drop it back to a walk, and then go again. And then what you'll find, you take away this big monster running, this big, Oh, horrible thing of oh god I've got to go out and I've got to run now for half an hour straight and I've never done that in my life and how am I going to do that and it's going to hurt and then you get into this anxious anxious state where you're not breathing correctly and then it hurts it's horrible and that, know this as well the first 20 minutes of a run for anybody is the worst um, once again you're transitioning from maybe being at work sitting driving car whatever you're doing and your body's not warmed up. And in the first 20 minutes, it's going to tell you to go home. I, you shouldn't be doing this. So just understand that process. That, that if you can get past the 20 minute barrier, then then your body will actually start to go, ah, oh, okay, I'm starting to understand what's going on here. And it relaxes into it. So typically for me, it takes me a good hour to warm up into it, really. And then, in, you know, from then on, I'm in my rhythm, if you like, and in my um, thing. The other thing is start to talk to yourself um, and, uh, as a runner. Start developing the identity as a runner. And what I mean by identity is that you're changing this. You're not just got I, I want to be a runner or I'm going to try and be a runner. But start talking to yourself in the terms of I am a runner. I have started. And if you go out the door and you put a pair of shoes on and you run, you are a runner. By changing this identity... You will always hold yourself to your, your own standards and your own inner identity. I'm trying to, trying to explain this. I have the identity that I am an athlete. I've always had this identity, and I will always hold myself to the standards of what being an athlete means, and that means training and fitness and all the rest of it. We all hold ourselves to our must-dos, and these must-dos are tied up with our identity. I'll give you an example. If you, you would never go for a week without brushing your teeth, would you? Because it's an absolute part of your identity. It's a part of your must-dos is I must brush my teeth. Uh, and if you have in your head, I must train because it's a part of my identity, it's part of who I am, uh, then that will be your baseline. You will not find an excuse not to run. You will do it. It's a change in mindset from being just... I'm going to have a go at this, is, it, is developing that mentality of that I am an athlete, I am a runner, I am going to do this from this day forward. Okay, So try and make that shift in your mind. The other thing is start surrounding yourself and start reading and start learning and start researching everything on the internet, start finding friends who run, start reading running magazines. But when you surround yourself with the thing that you are trying to learn, and you become engrossed with it, what happens in the beginning, it all goes over your head, and then slowly you start to learn things. And this is how I've learned all sorts of stuff, from neuroscience to second languages. In the beginning, it's all overwhelming, but I just let it. In the moment, I'm learning everything about digital marketing. I listen to podcasts, I listen to, uh, I read everything, I get every free download there is. I'm immersed in it, and it, sometimes it's overwhelming, eh? It, it drives Paisley nuts, <laughs> but... I have to learn it for my job, and I know if, if, it's, it'll, if, it, if I let it beat me, if I keep saying to myself that techni technology is my enemy and I don't want to do it, it wasn't part of my generation, then I'm going to come a cropper and I'm not going to be able to achieve what I want. I wouldn't be able to do this what I'm doing now, and you have your moments where you want to chuck it against the wall, and you will too when you're running, but just understand that that's just part of the process. And when if, if, if you can get through the first 16 weeks, you will develop the identity of a runner and you will actually start to become addicted. The, 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 the number one problem, though, with beginner runners is that they, they go hard out in their first two weeks, too hard out, and then it, it, by week three, so they might even see little bits of improvement, 
but then they, they, they build on it and they think they have to run longer every week uh, and it doesn't work like that. You have to go in steps and you have to go a certain distance then pull back a little bit and then push a bit further. So what happens is they get to the end of two weeks and they're starting to be exhausted because their body's like over challenged. You need to pull back a little bit then, just calm your jets, you know, just hang, hang fire for a little bit, do some stretching, do some rehabilitative stuff, maybe do some cross training and then ease back into it and, and, and go in step by step. Don't jump up from there to there because you ran one 10k once and then you, you know, you, you think you can take on anything. You have to build up that base. Do that and, and that's where you need a coach and you need a plan. You need to follow uh, a plan that will give you those guidelines to building that up and a good plan will, will, will um, allow you the flexibility to pull back when you're starting to feel overwhelmed, tired, fatigued, listen to your body, you're learning a whole lot of new skills. So don't go too hard out. And this is especially what men do at the beginning. Girls aren't quite so bad. So good luck with that journey. I hope you, you stick with running because it's, um, it's, an, amazing, it's an amazing sport. Um, we've got a question here from Colleen. Um, hello again. Uh, Jeez, we're going on long. I'm going to get off in a minute. <laughs> do you have any good running apps for starters? Oh, yes, it's more your department, eh? Hey? Well, I do use a few running apps. Um, I've got a, a Garmin watch that I absolutely love, and um, that logs my GPS. And What's the model? It's a Forerunner. Crikey, I don't know the exact specs. A Garmin Forerunner. Forerunner. Yeah, yep. there's um, hundreds of different types of GPS watches, but uh, the one I used, you link it to an app on your phone, and then that syncs it through to Strava, and then you can join other people online and help with motivation and pushing you on. What um, does join it give clubs. You? So it gives you um, like your heart rate, um, obviously GPS maps you, you run, where you've been, the distance that you've covered, um, your cadence, speed, your inclination, elevation. Um, yeah, I just find it as a good tool you, you to self-motivate and yeah. to know the distance that I'm running. So I'm not just like thinking that I've run 10K <laughs> when I've only run six five. or something. So it's, yeah, yeah. And, and it's just, I, I find it's quite helpful. Yeah, so some people but I'm not are into that. Them, so no, but that's Strava. So Strava is one, Strava. is a really There's good one. There's Map My Run, there's Matt another one that another one. a lot of my friends use. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, the point is, some people are motivated by that and some aren't. I, I don't bother. Um, one less gadget, I spend enough time on technicals. But he's motivated by that because it collects his kilometres, he can compare times with other people, he can compare routes, he always comes and shows me the route that he's done and it's all a little mapped out and, and the elevation and, and sometimes statistics. It, it's a safety thing as well, like they've got, um, like especially with GPS watches and the apps, you can actually have someone that's not running with you know where you are so that, you know, yeah, if fantastic. something happened to you, yeah, especially you can for be girls tracked out down. There. Yeah, yep. So it's um, that's a, a good great. little safety. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that, Hayes, because yeah, that's really not my department. Um, like I said, I'm learning digital marketing. There's enough technology <laughs> for me. Um, so I think we probably will wrap it up now. Well, Do we miss any questions? Yeah, well, um, we've got one more question, but before that, um, you're about to launch an online course. Oh, thank you. He's really good Is at that, it. Um, <laughs> I think it's quite... Yeah, yeah. So Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I've been working really, really hard on a e-course. This means an online course. Um, around mental toughness, it's called the path of an athlete. It's around mental strength, emotional resilience, and developing a never quit attitude. And it's a, it's a nine week course. And at the moment I'm entering, we're, we're starting a, as a beta testing phase, which means that we're gonna take on a select number of people at a discounted rate. And what we want from those people is feedback so that we can make the course a little better as we go along and improve it. And then later I'm gonna launch it on another a separate platform. Now we're doing this through Running Hot Coaching. Um, so if you are interested in doing this e-course, and this is something that I've delivered to your inbox one lesson per week, of approximately one hour of your time, and it's uh, me talking on, on, on different subjects. It's uh, some of the interviews that I've done on the podcast with really interesting people who give you different insights into different areas. So these are world-class people. You know, I've had world-class bloody world record holders and, and all sorts of people on the show who will give you a new perspective. 
Um, and then it's also, um, yeah, videos and tutorials, basically, on developing a mindset. Now, this isn't just for runners. This is actually made for executives. This is made for people who want high performance, who want to reach their potential, achieve their dreams, and not settle for mediocre. That's my big mission in life is never to be mediocre and that's what I've put into these um, into this course so if you're interested in in finding out about the course please email me at lisa at lisatarmody.co.nz or hop on my website join up to my newsletter and then um, I can keep you in the loop when we open up that beta testing which will be in the next probably two weeks very good yeah. um, so to keep up with Lisa on social media where can people find you you're all over over the place um, yep so on Twitter um, yeah, Lisa Y Tamati on Twitter or Way of the Athlete. Um, on Instagram, just Lisa Tamati. Um, around Facebook, obviously, you found me there. Um, and you've got a Facebook group as well that people are welcome to join and yeah. sign up. And yeah, so I have a community. There's different reasons to have different groups on, on Facebook, and I have got one called Lisa Tamati Health Fitness and Life Coach. Um, so join that community. I share different stuff on, on the different platforms. Of course, Running Hot Coaching is the coaching arm of my business with uh, partner Neil Wagstaff, who's an exercise physiologist and all-around nice guy, ultra runner and incredible human being. And he and I have developed a whole you know, running philosophy and a lot. I've learned a lot from him um, and I highly recommend you go on to runninghotcoaching.com and check us out there. We're about to flip the website within the next week, get these other courses and stuff online. Um, thanks for letting me indulge that. So, yeah, podcast, Pushing the Limits, Running Hot Coaching, uh, online course, Path of the Athlete. <laughs> I've got Websites. a bit of 88. You also, also run Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy here in New Plymouth, so um, anyone that yeah. requires that. I need to do a, a, a Facebook Live just on Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy. It's a, yeah, it's I'm actually incredible. in the uh, process of using it at the moment because I've got a sore, sore shoulder. Yep. So um, I'm using it for re yep. rehab, so it's Re really good. Recovers, recovery time is much, much quicker, but we won't go into that today. No. But um, hopefully we'll, we'll keep posting these live broadcasts. Yeah, and, um, maybe I'll two weeks hopefully ago. speak up a bit more Yeah, get a word <laughs> in. But it's good to be in the support there and asking the questions. Um, and keeping an eye on everyone. Um, it's just so good that you could join us. And, um, Jeez, we've rambled on for a, we meant to be half an hour. Yeah, we've gone for an hour. So, um, there's only anyone listening now, but probably not. No, there's we've got 21 people there. Oh, pretty cool. Um, and I can't seem to get this to work. So, um, so we, yeah, no more questions there. Um, there was only one, one more question, I think. Was it Rachel Lyons? Did you answer that? Um, uh, Rachel, yeah. Um, I'm keen to look at a longer run event, something trail marathon distance. However, I'm having a hard time grasping the idea of it mentally. The thought of the distance really intimidates me. I just can't get my head around it. Okay, right. So, Rachel, forget the distance for starters. Just go out there and run. And, and in your, in your, yes, you need a plan and you need to have a, a goal that you're working towards. But a number is a number. People get hung up on 42 kilometres or... 50 kilometers they are just numbers now, it's more important to, to um, focus on the number of hours that you're going to be out there and how you're going to prepare your body for the number of hours uh, that's involved in that race and if it's a trail um, event understand that if I'm if I'm doing a 5k I'm going I would rather sometimes do a 50k than a 5k and I know that sounds silly but when I'm doing a 50k I'm going at uh, sorry a 5k I'm going at 5k speed Okay, when I'm going at a 50k, I'm going at my 50k speed, and that's a hell of a lot slower. So don't go, you know, do your local 5k and you come in absolutely toast and think, how would I ever do a marathon? Or you know, I know Rachel's done a lot more than that, but you know what I mean. It's it's, it's all about what you put in your mind and how you make this ugly little monster in your mind about what it is that you're trying to achieve. Sign up for it, for starters. Sign up for that race that you're thinking about and then work it out along the way. Feel the fear and do it anyway. You, you can't, there is no, there's, there's no better way to do that. It's to just stumble along, finding your way. We will all feel fear. When I'm facing 200 plus Ks, or when I was facing Niger, 333 Ks across this most dangerous bloody country on earth, you know, 
I didn't know how to do it. Not you know. Um, I don't know how to how to. Uh, and you can't on an everyday basis run that distance. Um, but on the day, know that you will pull it out of the hat. You will, and you know you might well unless you DNF, which is perfectly fine as well because it's then it's a learning curve. But usually on the day of the race, you will pull out ten times out of yourself than what you thought was ever possible because you're motivated, and that's the key to your mind is getting that deep motivation and pulling it out and understanding your why. So think about what it, why you want to do this. Who you're doing it for, whether it's for your family, for yourself, to prove something, or for your kids, or, or whatever that motivating force is, hold on to that. So when the fear comes to eat you up and go, oh my God, but it's 50 Ks or it's 100 Ks, how am I ever going to do that? Just know that your body is capable of so much more than what you ever thought possible. And this is going to be a learning journey, and yes, there'll be pain, and yes, there'll be suffering. Um, but just sign up do it because that time will pass and once you've done it once your horizon will lift higher and higher and higher and when you haven't done it for a while it will lower as well <laughs> so keep pushing those horizons keep pushing yourself outside that comfort zone make what you can do bigger and believe in yourself don't let that fear monster eat you up all right i think we've talked for enough tonight thanks very much everybody for being on here really really appreciate you. I'm trying to build a community of people that want to learn, that want to achieve, that want to reach their full potential in life, and you guys are helping me to build that. So I hope I've provided value for you tonight. Um, if we have, you know, share this, and um, yeah, this cheeky bugger here, I think I'd better go and feed him. The husband needs to be fed by the yes. looks. <laughs> Thanks everyone for watching. Sorry about the technical issues at the very beginning, but um, yeah. It's good to do this, and I'm sure we'll keep rocking them out. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe shorter ones. All right, guys. Thanks very much. We'll see, see you soon.